Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. We know we're going to be back here later tonight, right? When our ultimate temptation of the hockey gods culminates in the Debranca trade coming through the moment I post this episode later today. I mean, I do have to come back to Kitchener later tonight, so this could actually work. Yeah, this is the one time the accidental timing is going to be good for you. We will have to grab, like, literal lassos and, you know, rein Evan in like he's a cow. Yeah, good luck with the episode. <laughs> I, uh, I hope you have hope for nothing but the best. We're recording this as the current news is the Debrinka trade is as close as it can get, but still not guaranteed to happen. It feels imminent and yet still far away. Yeah, I was going to say, it feels imminent, so I'm going to say three weeks. Absolutely. Don't send me another tweet about this until it's done or not done. <laughs> I don't, I'm done. Oh, here. we can send you a lot of tweets about it not being done. I'm, I'm, I can't take it anymore. I can't, I can't. Well, here's the thing. Not only are we going to send you all these updates and non-updates, we now have to send them on uh, like four or five different social media apps. <laughs> Please, I'm so tired. <laughs> No. <laughs> it sounds like way too much work for you guys, so I think I'm going to come out on top on this. No, one. no. What we're going to do is we're going to get you more active on threads than you've ever been on Twitter just for the, you know, hilarity of it all. Yeah. Who knew my real social media calling was actually threads? <laughs> he was saving. He wasn't tweeting. Well, I Because he was saving all the good content right, right, for right. threads. Will I be the number one social media influencer on threads? For, it's, right now, I'm up there. For, first to a million. <laughs> So for those of you who are wondering, yes, we're on Twitter. We are not leaving Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod and go to the uh, the bio points to our uh, individual profiles and follow the main account and all three of us. But we are also on threads, Instagram's answer to Twitter. Are we rooting for one or another? No, we don't care. We just want to be where hockey discourse is. So follow us on threads as well at Winged Wheel Podcast on threads. And then our handles are all the same. Uh, for our Threads accounts too. So you'll be able to find us all there. Wherever you're taking in your social media, you can find us, follow us. If there is a Debrinka trade and there's an insert, this episode's going to sound choppy to you. If not, and this kind of reverse, reverse, reverse jinx works or doesn't work, then you're just going to hear a normal episode. But for now, welcome to the Winged Wheel podcast. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit, Red Wings, hockey, the world of the NHL, Random social media apps popping up left and right, and uh, surprising news in terms of buyouts and a lot more. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be talking to you about the very surprising news of Philip Zadina. You know, the waivers happened last episode, but somehow there was even one more shocking twist in there, which was extremely shocking, and that all kind of came to a head today. So we're going to talk about Zadina being uh, bought out for the purpose of terminating his contract. Uh, we're joined on this episode by our good friend Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit, who's going to uh, uh, talk with us about his thoughts on NHL, uh, the NHL draft, how the Red Wings did, how Steve Eisman did in free agency, his thoughts on Zadina, and a lot more. We'll give you the update on Debrinkit, or maybe it's going to be a conversation about Debrinkit. We'll see how the uh, episode editing shakes out. Some more uh, wrap-up notes from the Red Wings free agency period as we uh, we still have to let you know about what happened with the Yamamoto, some other things going on in the NHL, and a lot more all before we take your questions in overtime. Before that, I want to let you know that this podcast is proudly supported by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash podcast. If you want to support the show, go the extra mile. Uh, if you join the Dub Dub Club, you get benefits like access to our Patreon-exclusive bonus overtime episodes, which record right after these main ones. Uh, they're a blast. We have a lot of fun and just kind of let loose. Uh, we also give you access to the Winged Wheel Podcast official Discord, and you're automatically entered into all of our giveaways for things like two tickets to every Red Wings home game uh, that we give away this past season. We're doing the same thing next season. The vast majority of those went to patrons. Uh, or you can win things like this cool Detroit Red Wings uh, slash Winged Wheel Podcast officially licensed uh, co-branded hat. So uh, all that and lots more a benefit to joining the Patreon page, patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast. Why don't we start here with the big one? The Detroit Red Wings uh, have placed Philip Zadina on unconditional waivers for the purpose of terminating his contract. And yes, that does that is as final as it sounds. So to rewind a little bit, last episode we were talking about Zadina being placed on waivers, just normal waivers for any team to claim him. He had two years left 
at a $1.825 million cap hit per year. He actually cleared those waivers. No one picked him up. And so we thought, okay, then this is going to end up how Steve Eisman said it was going to in his press conference. Zadina would be back at camp fighting for a roster spot and hopefully seeking to continually improve his game. That press conference, for those who didn't watch it, Steve Eisman wasn't, I wouldn't call him angry, but he was pretty emphatic, and you can tell that there's some frustration. Uh, he very obviously wanted to put Zadina in a position where, like every other young, talented player on the Red Wings, had to earn his spot. Felt that he hadn't done that, but felt that he had improved. And the fact that he believed in that is, you don't have to take my word for it. He gave him a three-year contract, which Steve Eisman doesn't really, he wouldn't give someone he didn't believe in. He's had no hesitation to kick someone to the curb if he thought they weren't part of the Red Wings' future. So Zadina ended up clearing waivers, and and we all thought, okay, the next step is Zadina is going to fight for a spot at camp. Probably this is going to end up in a trade eventually, but we'll see what happens. Philip Zadina requested uh, that his contract be terminated, and for those who don't know what this process means, it means that the team and the player agree to uh, uh, put the player on unconditional waivers for the purposes of contract termination. The contract is nixed. The uh, cap hit no longer applies because this isn't a 35-plus contract. Zadina walks away from all of his remaining salary, $4.56 million, so even greater than his uh, cumulative cap hit over those two years, and he's free to sign anywhere else. It is surprising because also part of this was Zadina said if he was sent down to the AHL, he wouldn't report, and that would be a contract violation in and of itself. But this is kind of a shock in a lot of ways from Zadina's perspective. I do understand why Eisman would be willing to facilitate it, but what a bizarre way for the whole Zadina saga to end. Yeah, there are so many ways to look at this. The first that we should mention is how incredibly rare this is. Now, you'll see throughout the offseason and during the season, you know, a player placed on uncondi- unconditional waivers for a purpose of a bio, but that's usually... Some like low level European buried in the AHL who just wants to go back to play in Europe and make a bit more money. They're on a league minimum contract. They're not walking away from a lot of money because they're definitely going to make more signing in like the KHL or the SHL. And to clarify, it's for the purpose of termination, not buyout. Yeah. Zadina yeah. doesn't get Sorry. any money from this. Yeah, correct. So he, you leave all the money on the table. He's walking away from a lot of money, and there is no guarantee he's ever going to see that again. Now, don't get me wrong, the Red Wings have done a lot that over the years that hasn't exactly helped his development but Zadina hasn't exactly done a lot himself to improve his game like it's not that he hasn't improved but you know uh, most of this is still on him now I respect the courage to bet on yourself like he's making a uh, almost literal four million dollar bet here that he's going to go somewhere else in a different system and do significantly better than he's in Detroit. Because if he goes and signs like what will probably be a league minimum one-year deal with another team, and it goes horribly, he's out millions of dollars. Literal millions. Now, that being said, if he goes to a Toronto, a Vegas, you know, a Dallas, a really good team on a league minimum contract, and they put him in a good situation, and he pops off for 40, 60, 40 50, 60 points, oh, he's making a lot more money than he would have likely in Detroit because it clearly wasn't working in Detroit we gave him every benefit of the doubt probably more so than anybody else and even we kind of were starting to get to the point of all right man it's like shit or get off the pot like we can only make excuses for you for so long and here he is going all right this isn't the place for me and I want out of here by all means necessary which again is risky probably stupid but at least you understand the thought process so I, I am very curious to see where he lands. Because if he leaves Detroit to go to like a Chicago or a San Jose, he's out of his damn mind. But if he does latch on with like a contender on a league minimum, okay, I, I can understand the logic here. I, I The problem with going to a contender is where would he slot in the lineup? Like there, he, I feel like his, the wick is incredibly short for him to last in the top six before he gets obviously moved down. Oh, he, he wouldn't even, play in the top six, he but he even, wasn't playing in the top six here. He either, can't even so. play in the top nine in Detroit. So how would he ever survive on an actual cup contending team? That you know, that's all you know, speculation and just kind of curiosity on the matter. But 
man, you got to have a, some big ones to to terminate a five million dollar contract essentially to to bet on yourself. Like, I don't know. I don't understand it. I see that as a monstrous risk. That's more than he's even made in his career thus far. You know what? The what? If it was me, I would have just sucked it up and you know tried to bust down the door one more time. But clearly, there is a difference in uh, talent and uh, where that player might slot up in, in the lineup from player to organization's perspective. If it, the question isn't about you know is the Philip Zadina wanting out of Detroit thing fair or good? Like, yeah, we cover everything from a Red Wings perspective, but looking at it objectively, he's perfectly justified in my mind to want a fresh start. Some of that could be discontent with the way the team has handled him. Some of that could be a mental thing. Have we seen a player, as long as we've been doing this podcast for like eight and a half years, has been more affected by the mental game than Philip Zadina? The clear and obvious answer is no. He's he's too talented to be as bad as he has been at points. And it's he's been in his own head, and you can watch it. You can physically watch how it affected his game. So, yeah, ask for the trade. Ask for the fresh start. Some might disagree. Some might think that's good. But I think that's fully justifiable from his point of view. But yeah, for the reasons you laid out, I just don't know that this is like I, I just don't completely understand it. He would have to turn his game around in such a big way to out earn the two guaranteed years of work in the NHL, or at least on an NHL roster, and four point five six million dollars. Now again, you know my tagline: I don't cry for millionaires. I don't cry for billionaires. Do what you want with your money. But for a guy whose own shortcomings have been self-inflicted. Like, that's the part of his game he has to turn around. Here's a little bit of backstory on how the organization and and this coaching staff specifically has felt about Zadina. You know, he had the strong preseason last year, but they saw a lot of stuff in practice and they saw a lot of stuff in his 200-foot game that they felt this isn't going to fit in this system right now. It was a lot of the same kind of qualms that uh, uh, Lalone had with uh, Bertuzzi. When Bertuzzi got healthy and he was playing, it was like, the guy's not playing any defense at all and is not really complying with the system. This is kind of a pain. With Zadina, he doesn't have Bertuzzi's talent, so they scratched him. Zadina, when he got uh, into the lineup, didn't really do much, got a really unfortunate injury, was out for a long time, had a setback in his injury. But then as the year went on and as he got healthier, he had that little stint where he performed really well, and the team was actually very impressed with how he was working at his game, how he was working in practice, and the, the adjustments he was making in the 200-foot game. And we saw that. We saw a reduction in his boneheaded mistakes. We saw a reduction in turnovers. We saw him playing more of a complete game. But And, and all that's good. And so he earned himself a spot in the lineup, and a, a praise from Lalone, praise from Iserman. That part was covered. It Was it enough to make Zadina feel satisfied? No, probably not. But what has Zadina been missing up until now? that has stopped him from breaking through to the the top six, from being a 20-goal scorer like he should be able to. He shuts off when he gets anywhere near the net. He hasn't figured out how to shoot at an NHL level. He hasn't figured out decision-making anywhere in or, or around the danger areas. He is excellent at moving the puck up the ice. He's a 200 foot player. He makes the, the smart decisions until he gets to the high danger areas in the offensive zone, and then he becomes invisible. And so, I can understand being frustrated with a defensive system that's harder on you than it is on, you know, Tyler Bertuzzi. And I can understand thinking, you know, why is Elmer Soderblom getting my roster spot when I've been here longer and am ostensibly a better player right now? That's all fine. But his inability to score or contribute offensively in a meaningful way consistently is not Derek Lalone's fault. It's not Steve Eisenman's fault. It wasn't Jeff Blaschel's fault. It's on Philip Zadina. And so that's why I agree with both of you. I have no problem with a guy betting on himself. I root for players who do that. That's cool. That's awesome. That's a big bet. Yeah, you know, it, it's sort of worked out lately in sports, betting on yourself. But when you look at who's bet on themselves in one, it's elite superstar <laughs> level talent. Uh, you don't typically see the guys who are getting scratched for Pew Suter uh, making, oh, making the ultimate comeback. Um, That's a devastating way to put it. Yeah, so you know, all the best to Philip Zadina, but holy crap, you either either someone's giving him bad advice or he truly thinks that he can do this. And probably both is the real answer there. Because I just can't imagine walking away from guaranteed money when you could, you know, in two years up that. Now also, you know, to look at it simply, the Red Wings 
are one of the, if not the worst offensive teams in the NHL. And Zadina, you know, fancies himself a scorer. So going to a team that maybe has a little bit more offense, you, you can understand the opportunity there. Again, he's not playing in anybody's top six. He's just not. Detroit, again, one of the worst offensive teams in the NHL, and he could barely crack that lineup. That's why I struggle <laughs> to say, like, let's if he wants to go to Vegas or he wants to go to Boston or Toronto or literally any of these, you know, true contenders, how does he generate offense playing in the bottom six? I do not understand. Well, you go to Vegas, their fourth line is almost literally better than Detroit's second line. So he doesn't so. even make, so he <laughs> doesn't even get in the lineup. No, I know. I, that's why this is all very confusing to me because yeah. again, he either makes a lateral move going from one, you maybe, know, basement team to another basement team. And maybe that's it. Maybe that is. Yeah, maybe it's you, a Buffalo type thing, you know? Maybe, it, like, I was even thinking, maybe it's Chicago just because they play a much more, you know, Anaheim free maybe? flowing. Yeah, Anaheim's a bad team, but they score a lot of goals. Like, they've got the talent up front. Maybe he's just like, yeah, I'm going to a new system. I understand that they're going to suck and I'm going to be buried on the third line. But if. It's better than, better than this. Yeah, maybe he gets a lot more power play time or something there. I, I don't know. I understand why he wants it to Detroit. Nobody needs to explain that to anybody. Yeah. Everybody gets it. But, yeah, to just walk away from that contract. But it was probably pretty eye-opening for Zadina. Uh, yeah, we tried trading you. We couldn't. So we literally tried giving you and your contract away for free, and everybody in the NHL went, nah, we're good. So that's what the NHL thinks of him right now. So he understands something has to dramatically change, or his career is likely over at the end of this contract. So... This was the decision he came to, and uh, I saw someone yeah. give give an example of, like, and of course I'm forgetting who the player is, about you know terminating your contract, go back to Europe, find your game there, and maybe an opportunity arises back in the NHL. Maybe that's on the the the, the table Did as Donov? well. But at is that, that point, is maybe? it not is it not better to just do that in the AHL. Like that league is closer to the NHL and will have more weight than anywhere else. Grand Rapids is also looking pretty strong with all the talent they have there. I understand Zadina's probably too good to be in the AHL. Like he's in that buffer zone. I think he's I think he could be an everyday bottom six player on the Red Wings. And if he has a good season, middle six. Like, sure. I just don't it's his decision. That's fine. And and I respect the fact that he wants a fresh start, but to walk away from all of that, I just I can't wrap my head around it. It seems there like there has to be a lot going on behind the scenes in terms yeah. of relationship with the the team, the management, the coaching, whatever. Maybe you you know that there's going to be an opportunity somewhere else, but you know another team phoned an agent. Not that they would ever tamper, but they phoned an agent and said, "Hey, you know, if we had a guy like Philip Sedina, we can't take him for one point eight two five, but we could take him for a million, and he's going to have a top six role here." Do that for a year, and then his next contract, if he believes in himself, could be four million. Like that, that I'm sure that's what this is. But... I can't imagine. Well, clearly, <laughs> Phil Zadina doesn't want to go to the AHL, so I assume it's NHL, Europe, or nothing. <laughs> Whatever it is, Linamar Beer League. Yeah, we'll take him. Yeah, we've got a roster spot. You think uh, Dominic Kubalik right now is looking at his passport and looking at what's gone on in the Red Wings in the last year and just is going, uh oh. No, He's, no. Is he the last standing check? Yeah, <laughs> but you know, Dominic Kubelik's thinking, thank God I scored 25 goals. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> Someone said, actually, when Kubelik was scoring, they're like, this is what we wanted Philip Zadina to be, right? I'm like, I think you're just seeing a scoring and check and then drawing the rest of the lines, but also not too far off. Whatever ends up with Zadina, Godspeed. But what this is now for the Red Wings is the Zadina saga is over. Zadina is officially on waivers for the purpose of contract termination. I know we talked about this last episode and a lot over the last few days, but this is one of the biggest cogs that never got put in place for the, for the Red Wings rebuild. Like how much further along would things have been? And just to reiterate for the millionth time, for the Ken Holland and uh, Tyler Wright draft management team, Quinn Hughes wasn't on the board, if not Philip Zadina. Before Philip Zadina fell to Detroit, and that was the consensus that he was a top four level player who fell to six. They were going to take Evan Bouchard, and if not Evan Bouchard, they were looking at Noah Dobson or maybe Adam Boakfast. It was not going to be Quinn Hughes straight up. I think they actually told Quinn Hughes that. So I, I know it's easy to say, oh, if only we drafted the best player that we could have at the time. 
that 2020 hindsight is going to kill you. It's going to drive you insane. But, man, I'd sure love to have an Evan Burchard or a Noah Dobson right now. Like, it, It's funny, too, because I've seen a lot of debate. And obviously, I, I brought up the point on the last episode, which got the debate going even further, of when did this rebuild actually start? And, you know, they were asking the question, was it 2019 when Steve Eisenman got here or was it, you know, back in 2016, 2017 when the rebuild actually started? And the objective answer is you know, it started back in 2016. But the way I look at it is this is the second rebuild. When Eisenman got here, it had to start over because Ken Holland left such a burden of awful contracts and an empty draft cupboard, despite being three years into a rebuild at that point that there was no other way to start over. And I see a lot of the national media, you know, rightfully, I will say, pegging the Red Wings as one of the losers of free agency because, you know, they got minimally better to get into the murky middle. And I think everybody agrees with kind of the general point we were making where, yeah, these players they signed are good, maybe a touch overpaid, but, like, what's the ultimate end game here? And... You know, they're like, they've been doing this for seven, eight years. You either got to start over or hit the gas. And you can see the logic here. But when you actually look at when this thing really, truly started, it's only been four years. And, you know, the prospect cupboard's starting to fill up a little bit. And you understand that you can't stay in the basement forever. But the Zadinas, the Rasmussen's, the Cholosky's, and the Sveshnikov's of the world are the reason the Red Wings are where they are. Because you simply can't miss four years in a row. Thankfully, Rasmussen turned into a usable third liner, so that that pick was at least salvaged. But the other three, they, they all ended up with the Red Wings getting nothing. Yeah, like not even they didn't work out in Detroit. They did not get assets in return for those players. Like they were just Chalosky was claimed in an expansion draft, which who else, with everybody else, the Red Wings had to expose. Almost felt like a win. Mm-hmm. Svechnikov again. You want to not be too hard on that one because the reason he didn't work out in Detroit was primarily due to injuries. But then the Zadina incident, and all of a sudden, out of all those Holland years in the first round, the best first round pick might be Joe Valeno. <laughs> Woof. Yeah, for me, the the rebuild didn't start until Steve Eisenman came here because you're kind of picking up the pieces and seeing what's salvageable from the previous regime. And let me tell you, it was not a lot. So you know it. Yes, it, it's been painful pre Steve Eisman, and yes, it has been as since that's sort of ramped up. But yeah, if the if the rebuild's going to be a lot longer, in my opinion. But it didn't truly start till Steve Eisman came in. And, and the ultimate point of this all might be, you know, Philip Zadina might be the poster child and the bookmark for this all. That is when the Holland rebuild stopped. That pick, that draft, that was the last failed year. And now the rebuild started again. And Philip Zadina is probably going to be the poster child for the biggest bust of that era. The only point I'll make here before we jump to our interview with Max is I think setting a start time, a start point for the rebuild is a little bit of a uh, uh, kind of a false. Like, I don't think you can put that flag stick in the ground definitively because it, it no you can't it's that not kind linear. of the point I was making yeah like Ken Holland signed some pretty stupid contracts but towards the end he did ship out Tatar and Nyquist for assets and there were things that started to position it but that doesn't mean that Eisman didn't also have to then go backwards again you know buying out Abdulkader doing this and that ultimately a redra- a rebuild starts through the draft and uh, if you whiff on three and now maybe even four if you whiff on those you're not rebuilding. And the overall point being, like, every GM is going to have good picks, bad picks. You know, Holland certainly had his share of good draft picks and bad draft picks. Uh, Every GM has good contracts and bad contracts. Ken Holland certainly had his load of bad contracts, but he had some good ones. Steve Eisenman signed some bad contracts, and he signed a good ones. He's had some bad draft picks. He's had some good ones. It's all in the volume, and right now... The weight of good to bad that Eiserman has done in the rebuild versus Holland is dramatically different. Mm -hmm. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't care how many times you guys get my mention. I still don't like the Sherratt or the whole contracts. That's okay. GMs are going to have those misses. I like Sprong. I like Perron. I like Kubelik. I like, you know, all these good contracts he signed in a couple years. Again, I don't like the Brady Cleveland pick. Trey Augustine. You know, Axel Sandin-Pelica. Great picks. It's in volume, right? So, yeah. 
that is kind of how you have to look at this. Neither one of them is perfect, but to successfully rebuild, the hits have to outweigh the misses. And that narrative changed in 2019. That's why there's never going to be a linear path to this rebuild. But that's why I kind of, in my own mind, Fair. as much as it as it sucks, you kind of have to reset the timeline because we're not in year seven of a rebuild, technically, because it kind of started over again. We're in year four of the second rebuild. Rebuild two. Electric Boogaloo. And I hate that. On I, that just, I need you to know, I hate this. On that miserable <laughs> note, let's jump over into our conversation with uh, Max Boltman. Max from the Athletic Detroit uh, joined us to talk free agency, NHL draft, the Zadina situation, and more. So without further ado... Good friend of the show who uh, needs and deserves the vacation more than the rest of us. Enjoy this conversation with Max Boltman. Max, it's currently 10.39 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday night, July 5th. And we are absolutely tempting fate, tempting Steve Eisman, tempting Pierre Dorian, tempting the hockey gods. Because we are not here to talk about Alex Dabrinkit. And goodness knows that trade is going to drop the moment we hit stop on this interview and you enjoy what is planned to be an 11 day break. Hmm, I don't know. The email link said to bring it trade details parentheses real. So I'm kind of expecting you hey. to make that worth my while here. Nobody's ever lied on the internet. We have like however long this interview takes for that to break for me to have the most unreal call of all time. <laughs> What is the what does the world come to? WWP clickbait. Email targeted <laughs> clickbait. Yeah, we have a uh we have a target list of one, but we're really hoping these uh <laughs> these threads pull through. Hey, it all intended. starts with one. That's right. Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast recurring segment with uh, our good friend Max Boltman of the Athletic Detroit. Max, we were talking before we hit record. It's been a grind. How are you holding up, man? I'm I'm good, but I'm ready to, like you said, unplug for a couple of days. Uh, you know, transactions permitting. So I, my my development camp takeaway story is planned to be my last for like like you said, you know, ten eleven days here. But uh, I, you know, it doesn't feel secure to me either. <laughs> <laughs> the trust issues that have been bred into. Yes, like the very fiber of all Red Wings content creators is uh, alarming, and yet we per, uh, proceed with you know everything that we do. Speaking of which, why don't we start? Uh, it's been a really busy time, and we're going to go in reverse order here. Uh, our last episode uh, on the pod was covering free agency, which was as expected divisive. Uh, there were varying opinions between fan response and us on the show regarding Justin Hall. There was a surprise with some of the players that. Bo- that were brought in and overall kind of, uh, you know, no one was really expecting Steve Eisman to go and replicate what happened in the off season of 2022. So why don't we get your overall thoughts on Steve Eisman's uh, hockey town hall and all the signings that were brought into Detroit uh, in general, what do you think this means for, you know, the eyes are planned, but his vision for the team. Yeah, I, I thought it was an interesting day. It wasn't necessarily what I was some of it, you know, I expected JT Comfer. I think you and I had talked about that as a possibility, but I don't know that I expected what the end, what the contract ended up being. I do think the more removed they get from it, I should have expected that because that's just what the going rate is. I, you know, I do think he's a pretty similar player to Andrew Cop, um, and I think the the contract coming in a half million dollars lower, the same term. It, that actually probably should have been what I was expecting, but I don't know that I was expecting a five-year deal, and that's what it ended up being. Ultimately, I, I think it's going to be okay. I think when you think about the timing of, of when we expect Marco Casper to be a Red Wing, when we expect Nate Danielson to be a Red Wing, you're really looking at like one year in each case uh, on the end of those, uh, additional to the end of those ELCs, and maybe none at all. So um, you're not going to be – pressed by those signings. And, and if, if that's what you're paying for your centers, that's absolutely fine. So um, it's, it's probably okay. It's just maybe uh, in, in the moment, I think we all were so hypnotized by, okay, the big, the big move is going to be a scorer and that didn't come and it hasn't come. And as we alluded to, it may still come. And if it does, you know, then I think, you know what, like I already think this team is deeper and if they end up deeper with a top six scorer, now I think we're talking about a team 
that I would expect to finish in the in the nineties, like points wise, and, and that would challenge for a playoff spot, um, which is what I think they needed to do this year. Um, if it doesn't come, then I still think they're probably one level below what what it will take to get into the playoffs. But we'll see. I, I don't think they're built totally dissimilarly to how the Seattle Kraken are built, but they play in the Eastern Conference and not the Western Conference. So I really like Daniel Sprong signing. Uh, I actually really like the Shane Gosses beer signing, even though I was very confused by it in the moment. That's probably the one that I, the most was out of nowhere for me. I did not expect a left D signing. But once you dig deeper, you see that he can play the right side. You know they needed a power play quarterback. That checks out. Whatever. They got the goalies. Justin Hall, probably not the right DI to sign, but let's see him out outside of Toronto. I asked a couple people about him, and the general feeling was, you know, Toronto cannibalized. Uh, they, they they get a scapegoat every year, and Justin Hall was it. So I'll give him, uh, you know, fresh eyes here and see what he looks like in new surroundings. I think I'm probably just going to scoop my website here. So sorry to my bosses. I think I gave him a B minus in free agency overall for for the grade. Um, what do you think of that? It was B minus or C plus for me, but I, I felt like I was punishing him too much for not getting a score. If I did C plus when there wasn't a score in free agency, um, I punished him a little bit for it, but who was the score in free agency? When we talk about the score, we talk about trades, right? So that's where I landed as was B minus. Yeah. This is the issue when we have, uh, when we talk so much outside of, you know, the show that people hear is, uh, I think a lot of our thoughts converge is I have the exact same thought for the exact same reasons initial reaction to the hall trade for example was you know not the player i would have chosen and i don't really uh love the term and dollar amount even though they're not crippling and uh overall just the sense of disappointment because you walked away without a solution to the scoring talent and you know sneak preview of our draft conversation like the draft in general but there isn't an impending solution to scoring talent through that as either so uh i I was a little bit harder on it to start, but once I started to think about the signings and the, the holes that it plugged, I understood a lot of it was doing what Eisenman could with the talent that was there. So I'm not going to reward him. It's not perfect. You know, yeah. I wouldn't have made the whole decision, but I think it's better than, you know, sticking Gustav Lindstrom in that spot. Um, so I think B minus C plus is like spot on. And Comfort is a good player. Like he might be the two C. I have him as the three C right now because um, I actually think Cop's going to really bounce back after he had the the abdominal surgery or core muscle, whatever it was, uh, that before last year that I think slowed him at the start. But he might be the 2C. And if you're paying $5 million for a 2C, you're really happy. Um, if, even if you're paying $5 million for a 3C, it's okay as long as they're like a 50-point 3C, which either of those two guys might be. So the, the, that one is the one that I think surprised me the most in terms of the what the contract looked like, even though I – you know. I think the player was on my targets list. Um, but the more I think about it, it's just, it's just what it costs. And uh, I think it can work. And I also think there's an element too of there's a Detroit premium right now, which isn't to say that Detroit's a bad place to come to, but this isn't a successful franchise. It doesn't have the allure of a 0% uh, state income tax. It doesn't have the weather that attracts a lot of people. So, you know, Brad said last episode until Detroit is the successful powerhouse Detroit Red Wings of old. I I do have the sense that Steve Eisman is having to spend a little bit more in terms of dollar and term to get some of the bigger names over here. So that's probably why we see, you know, a fifth year on JT Comfort, for example. They're probably paying sticker price. I don't think they're getting taxed, but I think they're they're probably paying sticker price. They're just not getting the discount that you get when you're Tampa, Florida, Vegas, Dallas to an extent. So with, you know, Goss to spare and uh, Justin Hall, Justin Hall makes sense. You understand what hole that's plugging um, at the very least that third line, right? D a good chance. That's going to be the second. I pair think it's right second D. pair. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, uh, the element that came up for me when the Goss to spare signing came through, which was probably unfair to Goss to spare because I do really, really, really like that signing was what does this mean for Detroit's defensive pipeline? Because Edvinson, you know, he is going to be recovering from surgery and he's not going to have an off season of, of training and, and conditioning for the NHL game, which sucks. But he's going to have to come up eventually as long as none of them get traded like Johansson, Willinder. There's other guys who are coming up. So this kind of reduces a lot of spot, especially on defense. So what do you make of that? Only until, though, like there's an, like didn't this happen with Zadina, with Rasmussen, with Valeno, like all these guys were like, wait a minute, they just filled their spot. And then with, I think by New Year's Day, but usually sooner, like I think Zadina's happened in like November, uh, there's an injury, they get called up and they stay. And, and Rasmussen, I think it was similar 
in the COVID year. Like, I don't think he made the quote unquote opening night, but I think he played like 40 some games out of 56 and Valeno might have even played, but I think he played like 66. So that, that's kind of my guess here. Um, Eisenman said he's not prepared to like carve out a spot for him in the top six, but let's see where he is in camp. Let's see how long it takes him to, to look like himself after recovering from surgery. If he plays less than 30 games this year, I'll be surprised. So do you think this roster, you know, barring a potential to bring a trade, do you think we're looking at in general what the Red Wings are going to go into next season? Because I do agree with your assessment. You know, this is a, a Red Wings team that's better than they were in March, April. But, you know, a point that Brad made last episode was this isn't necessarily a better team than what we thought the Red Wings were going to be last September because they had Bertuzzi and Verona at that time. And I put that in my free agent day column, that exact same sentiment of just like, you know, is this really better than where they were on paper a year ago? Now, the thing is, and I'm sure you guys talked about this, is like they never looked like that. So it could still be an improvement. So it's just kind of this theoretical uh, who knows. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think when I look at them right now, I see a team in the 80s. I don't know where, if it's 84 or 88 or whatever. Um, and that's – almost never getting here to the playoffs. Um, but it still could be an improvement and, and we'll see. I mean, maybe guys take steps forward. I think it's entirely possible that Lucas Raymond has like a 30 goal, 65 point season next year. And if that happens, my outlook on some of the stuff changes, but yeah, unless they get a score, I got to think this is it, right? Like, I think that's, it's July five. Like, I don't think you're seeing a, a, a may, a major, signing certainly at this point i think it's just if you're either trading for a score or you're not i was talking to someone recently and they they cited eisenman's you know um the improvement has to come from within and they were asking what does that mean is that valeno valeno and rasmussen and i said yeah sure like they've both been on good paths rasmussen especially but if the scoring is going to genuinely improve from within like you mentioned max it's got to be raymond you have to hope Larkin stays at the pace he's at. I don't know that you can expect too much more from him. You have to hope Perron uh, doesn't trail off or Kubelik doesn't trail off. And really, I think the addition of Comfer and a healthy cop, like if if those can just be both of them third line center quality, like NHL average third line center quality, as silly as it is to say, to have those as your two and three C, that is a massive improvement for the Red Wings and a luxury they've not had in, in what, a decade? And, and we think about just the – I know people get bent out of shape about face-offs and about handedness, but they – we I, Prashant had it and posted it. I think I put it in a story. Like, they got absolutely crushed in that defensive zone right dot all year because they did not have a right shot center. Like, that is a potential, like, 15-goal swing potentially. I think when you add it all, you know – throughout the course of the year, like that's a big, they got crushed on that dot. I think they were at like 30 some percent. Yeah. The addition of that right-handed center, add that to the other, you know, premiumness of the, of the player, like some other players that the Red Wings were in on. I, I know that they were in on and they just let go because they couldn't get a handle on the price or maybe they weren't keen on Detroit as a location. But when you're looking for positional premium and handedness premium, those two things combined at center, you, you kind of need to overspend yeah. in that case. Maybe I should say seven because I guess I can't assume they're going to win like win all those draws now or go to sixty percent, but like split the difference. Right, it's not going to be nothing. That's a classic case of oh, if the Red Wings had just won the fourteen overtime games that they lost, they'd be a exactly team. fourteen and zero. Oh. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. If the Red Wings were a much better team, they'd be a higher. But if they were just even, right? If you're yeah. just a fifty percent team, there all of a sudden, yeah, things absolutely. get better. Yeah. Uh, you wrote an article, and I'm going to link to all of Max's work in the description of this episode, but uh, one last point about the free agency. Uh, I really liked your breakdown of the the lineup that you kind of projected here. Uh, Philip Zadina is, was in there, and we'll talk about that after. Not in the lineup, just on the roster. Just on the roster. Which uh, may not even come true. And you had Casper, Soderblom, and Mazur on the outs. You know, As the roster is constructed, what do you think you're the most likely to be wrong about? Or what? who's going to kind of shatter what the uh, projected expectations are? Because I do think the roster, as you laid it out, is pretty much what we can anticipate before the surprises happen. Seems like they might want to use Christian Fisher in a in an everyday role more than I thought when I put that together. I even talked about him as, as like on a matchup line and, and killing penalties. I don't know where, who he bumps out. Like maybe it's Costin. I don't, I can't see it being Kubelik. I guess you can never be sure about Fabry's health, you know, all that stuff. 
I would hope it's not Berggren, but I was thinking, like, where on the power play does Berggren fit here? Like, when I was just going through in my head, right? Because you figure if you have Berggren, you really want him on the power play, right? Yeah. So, first unit on the left flank is either Perron or some, you know, right shot scorer who's five foot eight and from the area, anyone who comes to mind uh, there. No idea. Lark, Larkin in the slot, uh, Raymond on the opposite flank. I don't know who's down low. Maybe it's Rasmussen. If you if you do trade for a scorer, then maybe it's Perron. And then, you know, whatever. You're not putting Berggren as your power. But it's either Sider or Gosses Bear. Second unit, I would think, is Sprong on the left flank and Kubelik on the right flank. And I don't know who's in the middle there, but it could be Comfort, it could be Cop, the other defenseman, and then somebody's down low. I don't, again, I don't think you're putting Berggren down low. I guess maybe you could to go low to high, but if he's not on one of those power plays, does he get bumped off? It's too easy to say now without seeing how Berggren handles like a whole off season of training because you know he was a very productive player, but also the grind of the NHL game and speed wore down on him as the season went on. So he does need to, and it's almost a meme at this point, you know, really strengthen his game and be able to use his leverage from down low. Um, but if Eisman is so keen on getting scoring from within, I don't see how you can leave Berggren off the roster. I feel the same way, and I honestly, like, people were on me because I put him on the fourth line, not the second line. I think I agree that I think he should be on the second line, but I'm just saying the way that they've used him versus the way that they used Fabry, who would you project to be on the second line there, right? Like, I think it has to be Fabry Yeah, in terms of how they've operated. Yeah, right now that's Fabry. As long as he's in shape and ready, yeah, when he's good to go after his, uh, because he had his little knee scare, but they'll trust Fabry before, they'll make Bergeron really, really earn it. Yeah, and so like that that was my thinking. And so if if Christian Fisher gets in, you know, I, I don't this team needs offense and and I don't think Bergeron I I I think he's ready. Like I don't think he has anything more to really prove on the offense. You know, there's a little bit of defensive stuff, but again, like you at some point he's going to have to play to work that out. I, I don't like that argument for like 18 and 19 year olds, but I this guy was drafted in 2018. Like sink or swim, right? Like like let him try to battle through. And they did that last year and I thought it went well. Yeah. So Yeah. Not always defensively, but over on the whole so I, I would think and hope, and I, again, I put him in the lineup. I don't want people to freak out here because I'm talking about this, but it's just one of the things that was going through my head as I'm gaming this out is if this guy's not on the power play, is this a guy that they would scratch or send down? And and uh, is he still on the ELC? Yeah. So they could still send him down. So that like that would scare me too. Um, I don't know. I, I put him in, so don't yell at me, but I'm just <laughs> gaming that out in my head. These are things that popped up. Okay, let's uh, transition to draft here, and I'm going to open this up by saying, uh, if you folks remember, we did a Winged Wheel podcast mock draft, wherein we made our uh, our picks for the Red Wings, and it was a combination of like proje- uh, predictions, but making them somewhat realistic in, in who we'd pick. And uh, Max, your first pick was Danielson, and then we ran a poll after just to see what people thought of who do you, which pair of picks do you like the most, and which pair of picks do you think is the most likely. And yours with Danielson first, Max, was clicked as the least likely. And I remember in the group chat, all four of me, you, Max, and uh, me, you, Prashant, and Brad, I should say, all four of us were laughing and said, we all picked yours as the most likely because I had Danielson ninth. And lo and behold, Max Baltman is not one to, uh, uh, to applaud himself, but applause to you, Max. You called the Danielson pick. Well, I like to think that the fans voted it the least likely because it had Simashev at 17 and all the fans knew he was going six, baby. So the fans were just were just on the money there. Of course. This is the man who knows where his bread's buttered. <laughs> the Detroit Red Wings walk away in the first round with uh, Nate Danielson at nine, probably unsurprisingly, but somewhat surprisingly, Axel, Axel Sandin Pelica at 17. So let's start with Danielson. Your overall impressions on the pick and... Uh, who did the Red Wings get out of this player? I like the pick. I mean, it's the reason that I that I said in that mock draft. Like, I, you're talking about rolling out center depth in, in within the next five years. That I think is going to be incredibly formidable between him, Larkin, uh, and Casper. You're going to have three centers who are like six one or bigger. I think Danielson is six two, who can skate very well, who can play the full ice. It's going to make you a matchup nightmare. And I think all of these guys. All three. Larkin maybe less so now because he's finally getting, you know, 80 point seasons that people have to shut up, but who get, you know, unfairly 
like knocked for not having some like high upside or whatever, right? Like I, I hopefully now that people watch Danielson in the three on three tournament, they see the kind of offense that it can generate skating the way that he does. Uh, and, and I think he has underrated skill and I think there's things he can do. I don't, I didn't think he, uh, created for his, like, I don't know can you even call them line mates in three on three as much as I might've loved to see in this event, but the dude had so many shot attempts. He always had the puck. He was a monster in transition. I went back and I rewatched because everyone's been talking about that Connor Bedard quote that he was like the, one of the toughest matchups. I went back and I watched a couple of Brandon versus Regina games this year. And I don't think Connor Bedard had a goal and if he if he ha- against Danielson directly. He had points in those games for sure. Um, but when I watched all of Danielson shifts, I did not see a Bedard goal in either of those two games that I watched. And I don't think I saw a Bedard assist. But if I did, it was like one where like it wasn't like a Danielson blown play. It was like a, yeah. you know, there was like a face off that Brandon turned over and went the other way or something, you know, but like he was all over. I'll send you a few clips actually after this when we get off. Cause I, there was a couple that really stood out to me. Um, I just think he's a complete player. And this is what I've liked about him the whole way. I, I can't say that I can tell you for a fact what his like off, you know, offensive point totals are going to be, but I think it's entirely reasonable. I think he's just like put the potential 60 point center and that's a super valuable player. Yeah, when we uh, when we originally did the Nate Danielson profile, I remember talking to you after, and I mentioned to you the same thing I said in the profile, which is I really like his game, but whether or not I think he's a top ten pick, like a, not a pick nine or pick seventeen guy, just depends on the offensive ceiling, and I just wasn't completely certain about that. And you, and you we had mentioned be. we won't be though, right? Yeah. Like it's like you know the guy Corey keeps saying is like p- people will say like upside. It's like okay, well like he doesn't have the best like mixtape basically, but like. Does Rupe Hints is Rupe Hints dynamic? Because like you look at like look at the profile there, right? It's like he's not Rupe Hints today, but why why can't he become something like that? What attribute prevents him from becoming that? And I'm not sure that we know what that would be today, right? Yeah. Like, and, and this is Corey's. I'm not taking credit for that. Like that's but he, we've he, that's what he and I had talked about kind of after the draft of, of like well, why don't people think he has upside? Because when I talk about like a six foot two center who can skate, who defends, like what is this flaw that's going to stop him from being? really good I, I think he has skill i think he's smart like yeah i don't know maybe he needs to like jump the heart rate 15 yeah. percent. but i think there's also a poise factor to that right like I, maybe he's elias lindholm that's worth a top 10 pick like who, who knows you know yeah and after i remember after that i like i he was one of the guys i was zero i zeroed in on a lot just to really watch his game funny enough simashev was the other one and both of them i was like okay i'm starting to really be sold uh, the poise thing is funny because everyone was like, he seems so unenthused. I'm like, that's, I think that's just WHL players. I think that's just Western Canadian hockey players. They all have that same way they carry themselves. I interviewed him at the combine and I was like, wow, he really didn't like that interview. Like he, he <laughs> didn't want to be there. Okay. I guess I, I, maybe I got to revisit like, and it's, that was probably true either way that I got to revisit some of those questions. Cause I went back and listened. I was like, I could have done better here, but then I saw him again at the, at the draft and he, you know, he was in a good mood, but it's just like, oh no, he just. He's just low heart rate kind of guy. And yeah. there's there's a, a a value to that, I think, in, in professional sports. Hundred percent. Axel Sandin Pelka at seventeen. Like that to me I was I was surprised he was gonna be there. There were players what we were talking about where we were saying they they may be there at seventeen. You were dead on about Oliver Moore and a bunch of other guys, but Sandin Pelica was one that I did not think he would be there at seventeen. So in my mind, great haul by Detroit. Uh what did you make of the pick? Yeah, and they they talked about it. like I was not sure that this would be a guy they would pick because he's so different from what they've picked. And credit to I think Brad or, or might have been you, you or Brad, you guys talked about like yes, but like they don't they haven't picked him, but that doesn't mean that they don't need a guy like this. And that was their reasoning. They said they didn't have anyone else like this in their system, this like true uh, power play quarterback, this you know elite hockey sense kind of guy. And now they do. And, and I, I like Sandine Pelica. I, you know, I will be, would be curious to know if they would have taken him over Will Ander had they both been there. Um, we'll never know the answer to that, but there's a very clear fit for this guy in their system. And I love that because Moritz Sider is already in place, like you don't need to ask this guy to be something, you know, specific here. You don't need for him to be like a 24 minute a night, like all situations guy. He can be a second pair elite power play guy, which is super valuable. And if he plays 20, 21 minutes a night uh, and, and he's really good on your first power play, I think you are absolutely over the moon to get that at 17. 
Yeah, I think Moritz Sider being in place allowed them to take Nate Danielson at nine rather than Willander or Sandy and Pelica for sure. Yeah. So a conversation we had about the rest of the draft, and we'll, we'll talk about some more specific players here, but a conversation that we had on the show about the rest of the picks driven a lot by um, a couple of the second round picks primarily was, you know, are the Red Wings passing up on attributes that are that stand out? We use the word upside so much that it maybe has lost its meaning. Uh, but the ability to produce, the ability to score, uh, you know, if you're asking Brady Cleveland to be a third pair shut down Radko Gudas or whoever you want to compare him to type, that's great. But is that worth taking with the 47th pick? Uh, the Red Wings didn't walk away with too much at, uh, by way of like offensive upside in terms of forwards with their first five picks. So what do you make of that sentiment overall and, and apply it to the entire draft class if you like? Well, it's interesting because I, I think Brady Cleveland for first of all, I think he actually had a really nice three on three showing today, so that's kind of interesting. He did, and, and I think historically, if you get a third pair defenseman in at pick forty seven, that is like a plus pick. Like you did well in the draft if you if you did that. Just but like I get what people are saying. Like it's like Chase, Jason Robertson, right? And you don't know who that's going to be. But you know, I, I think they did take a few of those swings at forwards. They just took them in later rounds and they didn't get Felix Nilsson. They didn't get Oscar Fisker Molgar. They didn't take Carson Rakoff. These are all guys you and I, and everyone I think had circled for them, but Noah Dower Nilsson at various points, I think there were points this year where he was a first round talent and on some lists because of how insane his J 20 production was for Ferlunda. And you get him in the third and, and he's an offense player all day, right? Like if he doesn't make it, it's not because he, he wasn't, you know, skilled or smart enough. Right. Um, so that's one. I, I think Kevin Bicker, the guy they took out of Germany, was one of the standouts of Dev Camp for me, you know, mainly just because he was really fast. And I thought Emmett Finney, the guy they took in the seventh, his skating stood out to me. So I think they took forwards with attributes that like can play up. Now, you know, there's only so many Amadeus Lombardis out there, but like I, I put this in the, the comments of my story is like you can't chase risk. You can't go like, oh, this guy has all these flaws, so I'm gonna pick him because I think you know, if he fixes those flaws, then he's going to be really good or whatever. I think you have to look for guys like Lombardi or like Mazer, I guess, to an extent. I don't know what Mazer's flaw was supposed to be in hindsight. Like, I really like that player. Um, but Lombardi, in terms of just like being like, okay, he's really small and, and there was not a huge resume on him. But there's so many other things. It's like, okay, at some point, yeah, he's small, but he's fast. He competes. He's got a good shot, right? Like, he's smart. All this stuff. He says everything else except height. Yes, that is a player that I'm more than happy to pick. And they got him in the fourth round. Like, that's a absolutely like a quote-unquote swing, and I, I think it might be a hit. Um, he was awesome today. So I think they've they've done it at various points, but I just don't think you can force that. I don't think you can like be like, okay, in the second round, we're going to take a guy who is skilled, but we have three concerns about. Because that's chasing the risk rather than just yeah. not being afraid to pick a guy you believe in at a spot that you think you can get him, you know? Was it somewhat surprising to you to see one, two, three, four, five defensemen when the Red Wings defensive yes. pipeline is? Yeah. 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 But that's what Chris Draper says. It's just like it's it's their list, right? Like I was I thought it was the right call to take a goalie, and I think they should have gone one forward, one D in the second round. Like take Gibson and for me, it would have been Nilsson. Um, now, is Nilsson like this, like super high upside skill type? I don't know. Like, I like him and I've heard really good things about him, but like, if you read someone the profile, they'd be like, well, it's sense and compete. So is that high upside? <laughs> like, to me, yes, because those are two super valuable traits, but I don't know that everyone would have thought that. Um, I think he is skilled. I just, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, we're not talking about Fabian Lissell here, right? Like, who is the guy who, to me, yeah. That would have been like chasing risk. It's like, yes, he's really skilled and like fast, but there's a couple questions and that's chasing risk more than I think, you know, sticking to your guns on a guy you believe in. Mitchkov to me would have been sticking to your guns on a guy you really believe in. Yeah. The move that I, the moves that I really liked, you mentioned Trey Augustine, you, you like the goalie pick. They reloaded the, the goalie pipeline. Like right now it's Kosa and Guy Lander, but add Trey Augustine, who is an undeniable talent. And then the, you know, Carter Guy Lander pick of this draft was Rudy Guimont. Uh, yeah. So what did you make of, I called it Kosa, Kosa insurance when I saw Trey Augustine, but in all, they were just kind of refilling that goalie pipeline to give themselves options and not marry themselves to, you know, ride or die with Kosa. 
And I really like Augustine. It sounds like they really liked Augustine. So to me, that's like, hey, we always talk about like, what kind of capital do you want to invest in, in that position? Because, you know, it, unless you get a really good player, you can usually find Alex Lyon or James Reimer or whatever. And, you know, obviously, Vili Husso is probably the best example. Like, they trade a third for Vili Husso already in his prime. Like, why would you ever spend higher pick than that? Right. But, um, Trey Augustine is a really promising player. I, I don't know if people like fully appreciate what it means that he had the best save percentage in a single season at the program. Like that's a lot of amazing goalies that we're talking about here. He's six one, but again, that's what we're talking about. You, you take a guy you believe in and you live with the fact that he's six one. It's not like, Oh, okay. Like take this risk on a guy who was an eight ninety save percentage, but is six four necessarily, you know, like you could do that, but it's not how I would so much do it. Sebastian Cosa married the two. He had like a nine forty and was six six. Like that's a freaking bet I'm taking, you know? Yeah. And that's what they did. And and Augustine to me it's the same way. It's like, yeah, he's six one, but it hasn't stopped him yet. Yeah, the the Augustine pick stood out to me as like I knew I knew how talented he was, but I was like, oh man, he must be the real deal because I've been told by multiple people that the MO of the Red Wings organization is if you're under 6'4", they're not really looking at you. And I shouldn't even say the Red Wings. That's the entire league as a goalie. Like, you need to be massive. So, yeah, the fact that he's 6'1", but they still took him, it's like, yep, yeah, they think he's the truth. So, yeah, we're saving the Trey Augustine hype for, you know, we're, we're rationing our content Slow right now. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I feel like that, that hype train is coming in the future. You can save it. You can pocket it, Ryan, for, for the first time that he shuts out Michigan. And then you yeah. can use that as copium. Wow. Yeah, that's going to be the, <laughs> the fat silver lining that Michigan State listeners right now are going to be uh, really happy. <laughs> it's uh, it's late, so let's get to our last couple topics here very quickly. You mentioned development camp, uh, the three-on-three tournament, which culminated it culminated in today. But overall, what were your impressions? Who stood out? Um, any surprises? Yeah, so... Um, Sunday through Tuesday, it was Mazer to me by like, I was like, wow, he looks like very clearly the best guy out here. I, I thought he was good still at the three on three. I didn't know that his team in, on the whole was as strong. He hit a couple of posts. I still thought he looked really good, but I, I thought Sunday through Tuesday, and I know it doesn't mean as much because it's not like the one that's broadcast and it's not like as much of like battle drills, but just his skating to me looked like it leveled up. I thought he looked clearly like the most ready guy there. Um, in fact, I left the week thinking if someone's going to win a job that we're not expecting, like I think it would be Mazer and not Casper. Just leaving this. Now, Casper, I think this, I don't know how long he's even been skating, but he did everything, which is very Marco Casper of him. Um, so I don't know how like inhibited he was by that or what affected him. Still thought he was fine and he had a great goal, um, skated well, skated hard, whatever. But, um, I, I thought I left the, those first few days thinking like Mazer's the best prospect here. Um, or not the best prospect. Mazer's playing the best of anyone here. Um, and then I left Wednesday thinking like Amadeus Lombardi just was outstanding in that tournament. Um, so those would be my big two. I thought Danielson was good. I thought Casper was good. I thought Sandy Pelka was good. Um, Shai Buyum was impressive. We mentioned Brady Cleveland. And a quieter one that like really impressed me was Brennan Ali. Uh, a couple goals, a few excellent passes, and, and I thought really good compete. You know, it's tough for just like a 6-0 winger uh, to, to like really differentiate themselves unless like a great skater, have crazy skill. But I thought he did everything well. And... So I left pretty impressed by him. He's one that I'm going to follow more closely. And last news here, because uh, it, it dropped earlier today. It hasn't officially happened, but yeah. heavily reported rumors of uh, the Philip Zadina, you know, potentially not reporting if he were not to make the Red Wings and be sent down to Grand Rapids. And so the Red Wings are considering putting him or may have by the time people are listening uh, on waivers for the purpose of unconditional waivers for the purpose of terminating his contract which is a shock. The waivers in and of themselves were somewhat surprising, but somewhat not in the, the scope of the whole saga. But Zadina walking away from, you know, $4.56 million remaining over the course of the next two seasons, that is surprising. So what do you make of that news? I'm very surprised. I, You know, I didn't think him requesting a fresh start was crazy because I think we've all been talking about him potentially getting a fresh start for like two years, just not one that he would have initiated. So I, I don't think that's unfair of him. To have asked for that. Um, the idea that he wouldn't report surprises me. 
because I think everything that's been thrown at him so far, I, I feel like he's really just kind of put his head down and gone for it, even when he hasn't, you know, obviously been thrilled with the way things have gone. So um, maybe that tells you that he's, you know, really, really wants this fresh start or something. I don't I I can't speak for him because I haven't spoken to him. Um, but I, I was very surprised uh, to read that. And we'll see what happens here as a result of it. Because I, you know, Steve Esmond talked on Tuesday and was like, I, you know, I still really believe in this guy. And, and I think it's obviously it's been five years. You expect something to happen by now. But I, I do think he still looks like an NHL player to me. And maybe it's not a guy who's going to, you know, score 20, 25 goals. Like, you know, obviously we thought it would be even more than that when, when he was drafted. But even when I've watched him, I don't think he looks like a guy who, like, doesn't belong in the NHL. I think he looks like he belongs. I think – I don't know. It, it surprises me. And it, it – obviously his lack of opportunity this year didn't really seem to be like a team decision. It was just injuries. So I uh, was surprised. But I I think really highly of Phillip as, as a – as a person, I've gotten to know him over, you know, his draft was my first day on this beat. So he's always been someone I've, you know, talked to. And I think he's a really good dude. I, I wish him all the best wherever it is. But I, uh, I was surprised by that too. I'm just thinking about your first day on the Red Wings beat being the draft of Philip Zadina and your, your thought on a Red Wings timeline and optimism must have been so much different. It's embarrassing if you go back and read my stories from that time, honestly. Like, oh. it was like, oh, this changes, every, you know, they we were sat the tight, man. they got Zadina and they got Valeno. Cause all I've done is like read pretty much like Corey's scouting reports and watch some videos and like, okay, great. Like, you know, and not just Corey, obviously like 15 people scouting reports. Um, and everyone loved this guy, right? And, and for good reason, I, I did too. I saw him the first development camp. I bring this up with other writers all the time. It's like his first development camp, he went out on Belfort and looked awesome. And we all were just like, Oh my gosh, like this guy's, you know, going to score 30 goals and he, he's, he's ready. And uh, we were all talking about how his, when he scores, they should play the song funky cold Medina. And the fans could just, you know, chime in like another funky goal Zadina or whatever. Like, like we were, that was how all of us in the media you know, I, it's like me and a couple of the writers were just talking about this, like, oh, this is like a fait accompli, right? I don't know if I said that word right. But uh, that is how much we thought this would happen. And it didn't. And it it is a great lesson for me <laughs> in how it, it was probably the best thing that could have happened for my first draft is like, oh, these guys don't all hit. Like, yeah. be careful. <laughs> uh, and I've tried to take that to heart. Yeah. No worry, man. We were all there with you. Well, Max, it's late. We're going to let you go. Uh, folks, as always, Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit. Find him on Twitter, uh, uh, M underscore Boltman. If you are not subscribed to The Athletic Detroit, what we recommend you do is go to his Twitter account, click the links to one of his articles, and subscribe from there. Um, his writing is absolutely necessary reading for all things Red Wings, pound for pound, the best in the game. Uh, Max, thanks again for joining us, man. I hope we don't talk to you soon because I hope that means you get a break. But uh, if we do have to talk soon, I look forward to it. It'd be fun either way, buddy. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Welcome back. That was our conversation with Max Boltman. Uh, I hope for Max's sake, not even selfishly, I just hope for Max's sake that this DeBrinket news drops in a timely manner, if at all. So that man can enjoy his his time off. On that, let's talk about Alex Dabrinkit. You know, we didn't mention it too much last episode because things got to a point of, I'll call it stasis, where it seemed like Pierre Dorian just wasn't a fan of what Steve Eisman was offering. He called it pennies on the dollar. As Elliot Friedman has always noted, Steve Eisman gets to a point where he'll grind you, he'll grind you, he'll grind you, and then he just stops negotiating. He says, this is my offer, take it or leave it, I don't care anymore. Uh, which is a negotiating tactic. In I use that itself. in Settlers of Catan, actually. <laughs> do you? That's my. That's do my you win strategy. a lot in Settlers? Yes, I'm cutthroat. Yeah, that's why we're not allowed to play at our house anymore. <laughs> oh, you do that to to Catherine? Oh, there's yeah, there's no friends. No, well, there are. There's only they, people who think they're friends. See, the thing is, everyone has sheep, but I need brick, and so unless you're going to give me the brick, we're not talking. That's true. Anyhow, Anyways, continue. God, the amount of listeners we just lost. Yeah, but we did gain a couple nerds. This That's is right. fair. That's right. With Alex DeBrinkett, Eisman reached that point, and Pierre Dorian didn't want uh, to to move on it. That said, you don't need to read too hard between the lines to understand what's happening here. There's been conver- there's been uh, strife between the senators and Alex DeBrinkett's representation to say he needs to be willing to go to more teams. 
the representation put out statements to say, you know, we're not the ones who make trades. We're being as flexible as possible. Debrinka doesn't have a no trade clause, so they can trade him anywhere, but he's only willing to sign long term. It seems like in Detroit or other teams wherein they can't afford him. And so their hands are tied and he's exercising his right as as he's able to right now as a restricted free agent and next year as an unrestricted free agent. So with that said, the Detroit Red Wings and the New York Islanders are the two teams who are reportedly in the sweepstakes now. And it's looking close-ish with Detroit. Now I say close-ish because everyone has recognized that there aren't a lot of hurdles left to be completed. By all accounts, it seems like if the trade does happen, Debrinket will not have a problem signing in Detroit. He really wants to play there, so you don't think the contract demands are going to be insane. Looks like Detroit is willing to uh, do what they need to do to lock that down. Moving out, Philip Zadina frees up, you know, $1.825 million in cap space as well. But it's all about what is the offer to Pierre Dorian? Is he going to take the trade? If this is actually pennies on the dollar, then are we even talking about a first-round pick asset? Uh, equivalent asset going back how close is this thing and all of this is might be edited out in like three hours anyways well the islanders entering the mix is is really fascinating to me because they might be truly the biggest wild card now of all the options we've seen because lou is insane lou is a, to be playing a bad gm at this point is great but he but in this context he hands out contracts like they're nothing, like there's no future consequences. He'll never, he won't see the end of some of them, unfortunately. So he is way more likely to meet Debrinket's contract demands than Iserman is. Uh, Lou has a very uh, unclear picture of what the, what he thinks the Islanders are right now. So he is absolutely uh, willing to go heavy on Debrinket as a rental. If that's the option, because here's the thing. If you, the original list of DeBrinket's preferred destination, translation, teams he's willing to sign an extension with, is to be believed, the Islanders weren't on it. So unless he's changed his mind or has opened up that possibility, Lou might just be in this for the rental. At which point, then that's still good for Detroit because they still can sign him in a year when he's up for free and they don't have to give up assets. All that said, you know, you mentioned this in previous episodes, Brad, I have no problem with Detroit going in on this, provide offering some assets in a trade because look what happened with Pierre-Luc Dubois. A lot can change over the course of a season. Uh, Debrinket's price might get more expensive. If you give him a year, Josh Norris is back for Ottawa. He, that team improves. He scores 40 instead of 27. So his contract demands are going to go up. The cap's going to go up. So his contract demands are going to go up. Getting this done now is advantageous, and as we've been saying for months now, Detroit has a lot of really good prospects. They've had a lot of like really prominent draft picks, like high-end draft picks. It does not hurt to spend some of them just to get your guy. What was our motto for the draft? Where are the goals going to come from? Yep. This would address that need specifically. Mm -hmm. Yep. That did not get it answered in the draft outside of maybe a third-round pick. And if you're betting on a third-round pick, I got bad news for you. But, uh, yeah, because my mindset is, like, and I, and I know I built that quasi, you know, here's the Red Wings roster four to five years from now, where the hell, like, who can actually play in these roles on the team? And for, you know, three of the top six forward positions, there wasn't an answer. So, again, we talked about the Detroit tax last offseason. Detroit is not a free agent destination right now. So the fact that Alice Brinkett Put the Red Wings on near right near the tippy top of his preferred list yeah. is not insignificant. The fact that Alex Debrinkit directly fills one of the Red Wings' biggest needs, again, that's with the asterisk, they need more than just Alex Debrinkit, but fills that biggest need, this is an opportunity the Red Wings can't let pass by. Now, I am all on board with Eiserman playing hardball because the Senators have no leverage here, so that's very smart. But when push comes to shove, if the Islanders or the Predators or whoever is still at the table actually starts to pony up, the Red Wings have to step up. They have to because we keep talking about next offseason could be fine. You can wait to address these needs in the next couple offseasons. It doesn't have to be done right now. My main concern is are the players that come available in the next two summers going to want Detroit? Is to brink it if it, the play is to just let them go to UFA? gonna still choose Detroit because 
again, I, we referenced it before and not, not to keep repeating things. Dubois to Montreal was basically a done deal for two years until it wasn't, right? It just took one change of heart and all of a sudden Dubois is in L.A. for eight years now. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm I'm fully on board with get Debrinka for as cheap as you can in terms of trade assets and in terms of contract. But if he goes to the Islanders at something even close to reasonable, even if it's a little more than reasonable, and it's and the Red Wings don't open that. That's a failure. That's plain. Like if all of a sudden Lou gives him eight years by nine million and gives up like two first round picks, okay, yeah. But here's the thing, though. I don't think. I I think this is Detroit at the head of the pack. No, like, I, I think agree. a lot would have to fall apart for this to not be Detroit. So at this point, we're just thinking, what actually is the compensation? We were speculating as if this was going to be a negotiation wherein the value for Debrink at the player would be what was going the other way. But it really does seem like the offer was, for all intents and purposes, a low ball because of the because you know Debrinket was locked in on Detroit. Eisman understood he had that leverage, and they were saying, "Well, we got to sign this guy for eight years, and we're probably gonna have to pay him north of eight million dollars. So why are we giving you multiple first round level assets back when we're the ones poning up all that money?" Yeah. So we'll see how this comes through. Lose the wild card, though. I I really I'm not that to me reads more. This is just being put out there from the Ottawa side of things just to drum up some sentiment of it could not be Detroit. Even since that was reported, everything since has been, no, this is Detroit and Ottawa working to get to the finish line. Like, it does seem like, and I, I know I'm tempting fate by saying this. Wild card bitches. I know. <laughs> so we're, we're saying, like, this is the Red Wings. They're the ones who, are, who have the opportunity to cross the, cross the finish line here. The contract signing after the trade would would be the easy part, hypothetically, but it's just about can Eisman and Dorian hammer this out. But as we were talking about, Brad, we have to acknowledge the other teams in this or the fact that Dorian could just hang on to him because we don't want to give the fan base, you know, unbridled, unfettered hope that this is going to get done. Absolutely. So how would you what percentage would you give this that it doesn't go through? I, I'm probably up around a 40% that this doesn't happen. Again, understanding Detroit's in the driver's seat. There there are still so many factors, though, that could happen. Because, again, these are human beings involved. Mm-hmm. You know, minds change, things change, philosophies change. I'm not even ruling out that Ottawa goes, screw it. He's more valuable to us uh, as a one-year rental. Because Ottawa does have, uh, I don't know if I want to call it thoughts or delusions of making the playoffs this year. But that is their plan. Debrink it helps that. So if the, if the best offer they're getting is a second round pick and a B level prospect, yeah, I'd probably keep him as an own rental too at that point. Like, all right, it, it's probably better for this fan base. It's probably better for new ownership. It's probably better for the morale of the team that we just ride it out and hopefully get into the playoffs. And if it falls apart, they trade him at the deadline, probably for better than a second round pick and a B level prospect. Like, you know what I mean? So. And obviously, Eisenman's going, yeah, If you, I'm not paying more than that, so I'll just take my chances in free agency, which is where I get to my ultimate point of if it's free agency or this year, it has to happen because it's a rare opportunity for Detroit. So I don't know how Detroit has to get across that finish line, but they have to get across that finish line. And Ottawa has a lot of reasons to not get across that finish line with Detroit. They're in division. They want to make the playoffs themselves. Other teams might just pay more for a rental because Debrinket doesn't have a no trade clause. The Ottawa can send him anywhere. But again, cap space, you know, one year rentals, teams are are fuzzy on that. And my ultimate point being is this is such a rare, unique opportunity. I don't see it repeating itself next year. Mm-hmm. So I would rather overpay than risk him changing his mind before free agency rather than just not get him at all. All right, well, we'll see what's to come of that one. We'll see if I have to just highlight that entire segment, delete it, and replace it with the emergency recording of uh, this becoming a Debrinket trade and signing episode. But for we, now. we could probably just cover that now. Wow, that was a, a very reasonable price. The contract came in a little more than I thought. But, man, he's going to be a valuable member of the Detroit Red Wings for the next six to eight years. Wow, a <laughs> second-round pick, and William Willinder is the compensation. Very good. We like it. (laughs) I thought for sure it would have been Boston's first round pick, Albert Johansson. (laughs) Quick, Evan, pick two more assets so we can splice it in. 
Sorry, you haven't uh, paid me for that yet. <laughs> we we hardly pay him for the main shows. We can't have him uh, record contingency stuff. Okay, let's jump over to some uh, piecework news here. First of all, we didn't really address last episode uh, the Kyler Yamamoto buyout. So if you'll remember, the Red Wings acquired Clean Costin and Kyler Yamamoto from the Edmonton Oilers in exchange for future considerations. Read nothing. Uh, they ended up signing Costin, who was in RFA. Well, they actually didn't qualify him, and, and then they signed him, so not actually as an RFA. But with Yamamoto, uh, they ended up buying him out. So De- Detroit said, we don't want him at his remaining salary, which was one year at, what was it, $3 million? Yeah, $3.1 million or something like that. And they didn't want to take his uh, last year of his $3.1 million per year contract, so just one year left at that. And they said, we would rather have that cap space and buy him out. The impact for Detroit for that buyout was cheap. Literally $433,000 on the cap this year and $533,000 on the cap next year. So not much at all. Under a million dollars total. So with that said, they thought, you know, we'd rather have this roster spot. And it is a very full roster. Think about the conversations we had about the players they signed. And we were thinking, oh, this locks out Mazer, Casper, Soderblom. But it isn't, though. But one sec, they also thought we don't want Yamamoto and all his struggles in Edmonton. They thought he's a small player who's oft injured. We'd rather save this roster spot for someone else. Could be the young guys. It could be because they knew DeBrinket is coming in. It could be because JT Confer, but they just didn't want that player type in the organization. Now, that is, you know, somewhat of a statement because he is a player who has scored in the past on a much better team. But for all the reasons I just mentioned, they thought, meh, we'll we'll pay less than a million dollars over two years on the cap and just free ourselves of the contract in the roster spot. And the ultimate win that they got was Clint Costin. Yeah, Clint Costin was the more important part of that trade, obviously, because he comes in cheaper and he fits more of the Red Wings type of player. I can't help but think this was just a cost-saving measure, like not cap it, but actual dollars. Maybe they have something else in mind. Maybe... I don't know, because to me, this was a zero risk to keep him, other than you have to pay him a bit more money because it was only one year, because, you know, he's a right-handed shot forward who's showed offense in his career. Obviously, he comes with his, you know, warts, the injury history, and the fact that he's been pretty inconsistent, hence why Edmonton gave him away for free. But to me, it just felt like, yeah, keep him, see what happens, and if, if it doesn't work out, Okay, then he just walks at the end of the year for nothing. You don't even have to pay him, play him all year. Healthy scratch him, put him in the press box. It doesn't matter. If you got him for free, so other than actual dollars paid, and let me repeat it, I don't care what they do with Chris Hill's money, <laughs> but there, it just seemed to to have make no sense to buy him out. Because again, if it was a roster spot thing and Marco Casper came in and had a better camp than Yamamoto and you're like, we have to ditch Yamamoto to get Casper on the roster. Sure. Okay. Edmonton, we have our future considerations. Have you heard of Keller Yamamoto? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, you know, even though the Red Wings did fill up the roster a little bit, it, they, it's not like 16, 17, 18 players deep like people make it seem. The thing is they had a limited window where they could buy him out, and that's why I felt like they had to make that decision. No, yeah, it, it, I agree that it was a now or never thing, but again, I just don't see the logic behind it other than you save some real-world dollars. I disagree. I think I do see the logic. I want to say my personal opinion is you could have taken it or leaving it for me. I, I would have been happy to see what he could do on the roster. I wouldn't have been hopeful that he'd be more productive in Detroit than he was in Edmonton. No, yeah, my, my opinion is it probably wouldn't have worked out. But it was at least worth the chance. But I think for a player who is almost guaranteed to be missing 20-plus games a year, doesn't fit the build of uh, the bill of what they want in the lineup. Like, Yamamoto wasn't going to be in Detroit's top six. And does he fit in the bottom six for the kind of game he plays? To me, there's a really good argument that the answer that, to that is a clear no, and that's what the Red Wings did. I don't think this is about dollars. I think it's the fact that the buyout was cheap and they'd rather use the roster spot on Either a prospect that emerges. So to your point, yeah, the roster might not be full and and Mazer could break through. Then they're like, well, we don't want to block Mazer for Yamamoto for him to put up 36 points. That's the thing is if he had a better camp than Yamamoto and you feel like this guy has to have a spot, you don't have to keep Yamamoto on the roster. But you you buy him out now and you save almost the entire cap. Yeah, like I mean, the, the big downside 
to if this didn't work was you lose three million dollars. Yeah. Versus the whatever million and change that you are paying him now. So don't get me wrong. It's not nothing to save two million dollars. Two point seven ish on the cap. Oh yeah, that the Red Wings. I'll be surprised if they're a cap team this year. It's get if, with the Brinket, It could be in the realm of possibility. So if that Debrinket trade goes through, obviously this is a much different conversation. We don't know what that cap hit could be. It could be seven mil. It could be nine mil. We don't know, but that could be very relevant. And obviously that changes the conversation. But yeah, my overall point was it was a free asset on a one year deal. It almost was like like I said, it was worth the chance you know what i mean so we do it with all the other free agents we signed <laughs> yeah uh, i mean and uh yamamoto despite his stature has actually decent defensive metrics he's not a black hole in his own zone and it's only happened two years in his career but you know what he did in those two good years in his career he scored goals he's how many red wings players down the lineup have a season under the belt north of 20 goals he has one season at 20 goals so yeah but it. the first year he was almost a point per game player too and I think that was a shortened season. Yeah, 27, 26 points in 27 games. Yeah, so again, this is a guy who, again, through injuries and consistency, you're not getting him for free without some warts. But he has shown it. He has done it. And he's not spent a majority of his career with McDavid and Dreisaitl. He spent some of it. So I don't know. And like, I'm not super broken up about it because, again, my guess would have been it probably wouldn't have worked out. But he's the type of player we've been banging the table for the last five years to try as a reclamation project. And here he literally gets ham- handed to him. And, yeah, we get Costin out of it, so it's still a phenomenal trade. Like, it's still 10 out of 10 would do it 100 times again. But, yeah, it's just not where I would have been and not a hill I'm willing to die on. But unless you run out of cap space, which if the Red Wings run out of cap space this year, how the hell? Because <laughs> they had $30 million a week ago. But uh, <laughs> they Elon Musked it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, if they actually got in a position where they couldn't keep Yamamoto because they ran out of cap space, holy shit. But no. it, I, I digress. I'm on the inverse side of the, the spectrum from you. For me, it's this is just Eisman wanting to be responsible with every cap dollar, whether he needs it or not. It's just good practice. And it's the way he's operated from the start. Look at when he bought out players who he could have wrote out their contracts. He said, I can have someone else who can do a better job for cheaper. This is, yeah, more of a borderline decision. So, again, not willing to die on this hill either. I, I understand your perspective. But for me, it's Yamamoto's 24. They know what he is. They know what he could probably bring to the lineup. And it's probably better for them to save that cap and have the flexibility. But all in all, it seems to be this decision in general is a, you can take it or leave it. And the Red Wings chose to leave it. How long do you think the tribute video will be? Oh, <laughs> longer than his career in Detroit. Both intermissions, a couple stoppages worth. I just want you to know I have zero and in real influence in the hockey world but if i can do any one thing it would be to convince the red wings to do a yamamoto tribute video and you be there in person for that just to watch you melt absolutely implode i have, no, I have no response to this. seattle's only in detroit one game this year i'm just saying the opportunity it's there is pinpointed okay uh very quickly other contracts that kind of came through what did you guys think of the Klingberg contract, for example, him going to Toronto on a one-year $4.15 million deal. I'm going to talk about this as a whole because the Maple Leafs going Klingberg, Domi, and Bertuzzi in free agency, boy, are they leaning in on winning every game 7-6 instead of 2-1. Pretty much. Like, all gas, no breaks, none at all, zero, none. <laughs> Whoever. Speaking of betting on yourself, let's yeah. talk about John Klingberg. Oh, no, that's like the most tragic story in that regard in the NHL. But much like Bertuzzi, uh, hey, he could. there's a reality here where John Klingberg gets a decent contract next year because in Toronto this year he puts up 65 points despite being like a minus 24. There's also the uh, chaotic moves that Lou Lamorello made signing everyone to seven-year deals. Like Ilya Sorokin, I actually think that's a very handy contract for them. Yep, I think absolutely. Eight, Sorokin, eight years times $8.25 million. Like, yes, is it risky to sign a goalie for eight years? Sure, but I think Sorokin is the real deal, and they probably got him well under value. He'll have bad years in there, as every goalie does, but by and large, they have their goaltending set up for a whole generation. But seven years elsewhere is, oh, oh you can probably hear the rain pick up now. Seven years for Engvall, Engvall Mayfield. and seven years for Mayfield is 
don't give depth term. Like, has nobody learned that yet? That has been, I mean, we're probably more sensitive to this living through the Kenny Holland era, but like, don't get, I don't care what the cap hit is. Don't give depth players term. I'm upset about three years for Justin Hole, and that's probably very reasonable term for Justin Hole, and I'm still upset about it. Seven years for a middle pair defenseman and a bottom six forward. Lou Lamorello absolutely is betting on the fact that he is not going to be part of that organization in five years. He knows, he's got to know his team's actually probably more likely to miss the playoffs than make it this year, but he has no other choice, so he's just all in on we're keeping whatever good players we can and the the next GM be damned. Okay, with that, uh, we are going to not make you listen to uh, a rainstorm patter against the roof of uh, the studio, and uh, we'll jump into overtime here for the last segment of this episode. S- sorry, I, w- I wasn't sure if we were going to talk about Vlad Tarasenko basically kiboshing himself as well. Oh, God, who knows what's going to happen with that one. Had the deal secured with, with Carolina. Like seven teams all offered him huge contracts. And fired his agent, and now they've reset the entire process. It's... I. Yeah, this has been a weird, this is like a contract episode. Yeah, it's been, you almost don't, you almost want like an HBO 24-7 behind the scenes of just free agency, because there's so much to this where you're like, uh, there's stuff that we're not exposed to in the public that we want to know, like what conversations happened between this player and agent. Yeah, Anyways. what a shocking headline to read that he turned down basically six or seven teams with term and good money. And is now back at square one. Hey, if Debrinka doesn't work out for Detroit, you can go uh, short-term Tarasenko. I guess so. Okay, we're going to jump into overtime. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash podcast. If you want to support the show for the benefits we talked about before, it helps us grow the show. It helps us support the Jamie Daniels Foundation, run Winged Wheel Podcast Nights at the LCA in, uh, in partnership with the Detroit Red Wings, and a lot more. Let's take some questions from our listeners. One-Eyed Larry says, how do you feel about Amadeus Lombardi after his huge step up in production uh, in the OHL last year? Is this more a function of age in a development league than a sign of him taking a big step in development? Did his production last year change what you think his realistic ceiling is? Like everything in life, the answer is probably truly in the middle somewhere. Um, Without rehashing his unique path to get there, which the main point of being here, delayed development, I think it was reasonable to expect him to take a pretty big step from year one to two in the OHL, given that it was his, you know, 18 and 19 year old years, um, which is pretty rare given his circumstances. But yeah, he took a huge step, had a huge year. He has all the tools, but, you know, he's a sub six foot centerman. So I don't know if his future in Detroit's on the wing or at center, but I love the player and we've talked through this whole rebuild about you have to find middle six or better contributors late in the draft just to supplement your first round picks. Otherwise you can't effectively rebuild Carter Mazur and Lombardi could be those guys. And they're looking like they're going to be those guys. I don't think Lombardi's ever going to get to the NHL and put up a point per game, but you know, you slot them in second or third line, you know, left wing, third line center, whatever. And he's putting up 50, 60 points. That's a huge win in the fourth round. And Mazur looks like he could be doing the exact damn thing, maybe even more likely to, given um, his style of play. Yeah, these these look like uh, specifically two very, very big mid-round wins for the Red Wings. This one from Barnsey, brand new name level supporter from uh, Newcastle, Australia. So, Barnsey, thank you so much for your support from Down Under. Uh, they say, I'm looking forward to next season, but it really uh, set in with the tone of the last one. I think out of training camp, we are really going to see some of the younger key players step up and compete for a spot. Not a huge amount of players on our roster. Who do you think is a surprise to make the roster this year? And who do you think will either struggle to compete for a roster spot? I still really do believe in what Carter Mazur can yeah. do. For the reasons we've outlined before, Brad as well. Like He's played at against some really tough competition, and it just seems to be his style of game. And you saw it in development camp. like He, he has Sean in that regard i think he can make some noise and who's going to struggle to make the roster well <laughs> the answer before today would have been philip zadina other than that uh, no i think it's a good answer i really don't think he's going to make this roster yeah uh, it's pretty safe maybe, bet maybe now. simon evanson trying to shake off the rust post injury if he's even ready yeah if he's even ready yeah but i don't know if that's a surprise 
Christian Fisher. It's I'm curious to see where he'll fit in. You know what Max was saying in the uh, in our interview with him is with Berggren. He should be in the lineup, but does he find himself much lower because he isn't on a power play unit? But that's all speculation. He should be okay. That that's just like an outside shot. Yeah, I mean Berggren. Uh, you know, one of the primary playmakers in the Red Wings was also what their like fifth or sixth leading goal scorer last year. Uh, I that he's very productive in a short period. I of time. would say it would be very surprising if he struggles to make the team out of camp next year. So, yeah, I I have a hard time getting on that one. The one I fear is Joe Valeno. I don't think that'll happen because I think we have we all agree we've liked the steps Valeno has taken. But given the players they have signed, he's probably the most at risk. They're making him earn it. Yeah. They're absolutely yeah. making him And I'm not saying I think I'm concerned, but because, I, again, I really like the way Valeno's progressed. But, yeah, just, just with the type of players they've signed and where the depth chart's sitting right now, he, he's got to have a good camp. The Jack Scientist says, uh, how many of the top 50, 10 or 15 out of this year's draft can we expect to see in the NHL within two to three years? The talent seems high. Also seeing shots of Sandine Pelka at development camp really got me excited. He looks like he could be an outstanding player in a few years. Two to three years? I'd say almost all of them. It should, and within two to three years, that should be most of them. Yeah, a- any pick in the top 10, like for me, if uh, in your third season post draft, so two years in the AHL, junior Europe, wherever, you should be in the NHL that third year. Yeah. You should. Otherwise, something's probably going wrong. So obviously for us, that would be Danielson. And yeah, my expectation, especially as a late birthday for him, is one more year in junior because he has to. That's the only option for him given the CBA works. One year in the AHL, and then he damn well better be on the Red Wings the year after or else we're going to have some concerns. Udalali says, uh, this is an interesting one. How do you feel about uh, getting a pro jersey with your name and number? Bad. As an adult, don't do yeah. it. As a kid, I'm all for it. 100%. As an adult, look, you know what? You're going to pay good money for I, What it ultimately comes down for me is you're going to pay good money for a jersey. Do whatever the hell you want with it, by all means. Like I'm not going to say you absolutely are not allowed, but for me, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I make one exception. The only way you are allowed to put your own name on a jersey as an adult is if it's number 69 because you're leaning into the joke. (laughs) Agreed. It has to be a meme. Pick 69. It'll be hilarious. Okay. With that, we're actually going to wrap up. I know not too many Patreon uh, comments today. We'll we'll get to the rest in overtime. But uh, this rainstorm is going to ruin our audio and uh, we have to get out of here to uh, let the hockey gods thus initiate the the Alex DeBrinca trade. So thank you all so much for for tuning in. We greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, for all of our patrons, thank you so very much. We we can't say thank you enough for your support. To all of our listeners, new and old, uh, thank you for tuning in. If you've been here for a while, amazing. And if you're new to the show, we hope you enjoy it. And uh, to all of our name level supporters on Patreon, we cannot have done it without you. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, uh, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Raymond's Missing Tooth, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland, Glenn Brabham, Marcus Nolang, Nicholas Brodeen, Barnsey, Sea Lion 22, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels. Also, Sea Lion, welcome to the Dub Dub Club, as well as Barnsey. Uh, Matthew M. Rice, Coroner's Left Knee, Actual Garbage, Admiral Matt S. of the Cheesebag Navy, Babe Landiscog, Carl Bruton and Anna Carzone 13, brand new name level sponsor, Citizen High Five, Clip Clop Nay Nay, <laughs> brand new name level sponsor, welcome. Connor Scobie, Cooking with Kosa, Coyote, T- Coyote Season Tickets in Anywhere But Tempe, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassam al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Kaylin Wood, King Tone, Marcus, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, Prashanth, The Goalie Truther, Ayerzerman, RA, Red 3, Ryan, Big Brass Ones, Hannah, Ryan Hubbard, Scott Barton, That's What I Appreciate it's About You, The Mexinadian, Wellman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan, Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, Number One Red Guys Fan, A.A. Ron, Adam Rose, Big Cheese, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Captain Antonio Gracias of the United Federation of Cheesebags, Chuck Buff Chest, the Tarpless Goon, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheesebag Space, Space Force, Connor, Connor Leighton, Corey Prita, Darren Fick, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, Instructions Unclear, Cheesebag No Longer Fresh, 
James Laporte, James Pridemore, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Linda Hall, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson. <laughs> nope, not reading that one either. Read uh, M. Khalifa, <laughs> Norris Sider, O. Ophelia, Pavel Duck Soup, Ryan Hanna's Big Brass Ones, Shahid Syed, Steven, Tatar Sauce, The Hodag, and The Hat123. Also, your second favorite patron. Thank you all so very much. We'll talk to you either Sunday or once the Patreon or once the uh, Debrinket Emergency episode comes out. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.